thank you for this uh, opportunity we have again to study your word and we pray uh, that you open our eyes and open our hearts to your truth as we pray as your humble servants. Amen. We are on Judges chapter 5 and we should finish 5 and 6 this evening. Verse 1 says, And Deborah and Barak the son of Ebenoam sang on that day, saying. Now, uh, Deborah and Barak, they sing a song that, that retells much of what has happened here. The song consists of eight stanzas, and the first stanza is a praise of thanksgiving. Verses 2 and 3, Then that the elders led in Israel, that the people volunteered, bless Yahweh. Hear, O kings, give ear, O rulers, I to Yahweh, I will sing, I will sing praise to Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel. So uh, Deborah and Barak, they, they praise Elohim for the volunteers who defeated Sisera and Jabin. And we're going to find out not everybody volunteered. Some did, some didn't. Verses 4 and 5. Yahweh, when you did go out from Seir, when you did march from the field of Edom, the earth quaked, the heavens also dripped. Even the clouds dripped water. The mountains quaked at the presence of Yahweh. This Sinai at the presence of Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel. Now Seir is a mountain range in Edom. Elohim spoke to Israel from the mountains of Sinai, Seir, and Paran. And they're praising Elohim for giving them the Torah for their possession. We read in Deuteronomy 33, verses 2 through 4, And he said, Yahweh came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. And he came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand there was flashing lightning for them. Indeed, he loves the people. All the holy ones are in your hand, and they follow in your steps. Everyone receives of your words. Moses charged us with a Torah, a possession for the assembly of Jacob. Verse 6 of Judges 5. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted, and travelers went by roundabout ways. Remember Shamgar? What'd Shamgar do? You can't forget Shamgar already, can you? Okay, everyone forgot him already. What if I were to uh, show you that? Okay, what, what did Shamgar do? He killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad. That's in... Uh, Chapter 3, verse 31, And after him came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox go, and he also saved Israel. You know, you'd think a guy that killed 600 Philistines with an ox go deserves more than one verse. Right? Yeah, well, he ended up, he got two, but <laughs> he, got, he got that one, and he got that one. And I don't know if he's ever mentioned again. But uh, he falls under that category, in my opinion, of a, of a tough guy. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that fit? The scripture has a lot of tough guys in it, and this guy's got to be in the top ten, even though he's only mentioned twice. Yeah. You know, some of them do fight back. You get up 600 of them around you. Uh-huh. Granted, it's no jawbone of an ass, but an ox goat is still, it's not an automatic weapon, by golly. Now, in this, in this passage here, you see in the days of Shamgar and Jael, no one traveled on the highways due to the danger from other people living amongst them. Remember, they didn't drive everybody out, so they're living amongst them now. Okay? It's dangerous. See, the highways were deserted. Travelers went by roundabout ways. Well, they're waiting on the highways for them to come by and rob them blind, kill, whatever. Yeah. Right now it does, doesn't it? About like London. <laughs> uh, was that Sweden where there, what, 90, how many cars went up in flames? Yeah. Was there 90? Uh, it was an orchestrated effort. I think they set fire to 90 cars. Uh-huh. Just the other day. Uh-huh. Yes, it's, uh, I, I, I guess it's, uh, traditional Islamic greeting is to burn, burn 90 cars. 
Verse 5, the peasantry ceased. They ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose. Until I arose a mother in Israel. See, the peasants, that's a reference to the rural population. They, they disappeared during this time of, uh, of oppression. <clears throat> Verse 8, new gods were chosen. Then war was in the gates. Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. Now we come to the root of the problem. The people chose new gods. The people oppressing them did not let them have weapons. Okay? They passed new gun laws. Didn't let, didn't let the honest people have any guns. And, well, no swords either. Nothing, no weapons. This happens uh, later to Israel also. We read about it in 1 Samuel 13, starting at verse 19. Now, no blacksmith could be found in all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines, each to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock, his axe, and his hoe. And the charge was two-thirds of a shekel for the plowshares, the mattocks, the forks, and the axes in to fix the hoes. So it came about on the day of battle that neither sword nor spear was found in the hands of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan, but they were found with Saul and his son, Jonathan. So if you can control the weapons, you can control the people. That's what they were trying to do. Verse 9, my heart goes out to the commanders of Israel, the volunteers among the people. Bless Yahweh. You who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who travel on the road, sing. At the sound of those who divide flocks among the watering places, there they shall recount the righteous deeds of Yahweh, the righteous deeds for his peasantry in Israel. Then the people of Yahweh went down to the gates. Okay, now those who divide the flocks among the watering places, those are robbers and criminals who would prey upon those who come down to get water. Now, in the New King James, interestingly enough, in that verse, they're called archers. Far from the noise of the archers among the watering places, there they shall recount the righteous acts of Yahweh. The righteous acts for his villagers in Israel, and the people of Yahweh shall go down to the gates. <clears throat> um, archers, in interesting term to use there. There's only one man in Scripture that's called an archer. Who is that? Anybody recall? It's in Genesis. Ishmael. Ishmael. So this is a reference to Ishmaelites. Um, the ancestors of the Arab Muslims, one of the ancestors. Verse 12. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake. Sing a song. Arise, Barak, and take away your captives, O son of Abinoam. Then survivors came down to the nobles. The people of Yahweh came down to me as warriors. From Ephraim, those who... Root is in Amalek, came down, following you, Benjamin, with your peoples. From Makir, commanders came down, and from Zebulun, those who wield the staff of office. They were singing over the victories of their, uh, of their victories over their enemies. Those from Ephraim, Benjamin, Makir, and Zebulun, they volunteered for surface, service. And Makir, that's a son of Manasseh. So uh, it's just people from the various tribes there that volunteered for military service. Verse 15, and the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, as was Issachar. So was Barak, into the valley they rushed at his heels. Among the divisions of Reuben there were great resolves of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the piping for the flocks? Among the divisions of Reuben there were great searchings of heart. Gilead remained across the Jordan, and why did Dan stay in ships? Asher sat at the seashore and remained by its landings. So we're told that Issachar was with them also, and it appears that Reuben and Gilead, now Gilead, that's probably a, a Gad and Manassas, East Manassas, and Asher and Dan did not join. They didn't join in. <clears throat> Verse 18, Zebulun was a people who despised their lives even to death, and Naphtali also on the high places of the field. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan at, at Tanakh, near the waters of Megiddo. They took no plunder in silver. The stars fought from heaven, from their courses they fought against Sisera. Um, we're told righteous Israel is called 
the stars of heaven. And that title is used consistently without, throughout Scripture. The stars of heaven. Um, whenever you see a reference to the stars of heaven, it's, and it's mostly, almost always symbolic, it's a reference to Israel. Okay? When it says the sun, moon, and stars, the sun will turn red, or the, the sun won't give its light, the moon will turn red, and the stars will fall from the sky. What's that mean? Israel's in trouble. That's what that means. It does not mean that the Virgo constellation is low in the sky and Saturn's passing through her womb. Okay? It does not mean that. That was just recent. That was being advertised. No, they don't. People that go, go these blood moons, oh, these guys. They, uh, they wear me out with the silliness. Well, they sure know how to sell books, though. So. Uh, who's that little imp guy that, that sold the Blood Moons book? Uh, it's got so much money. Guy down in Texas. Hagee. Hagee. John Hagee. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Well, he thanks everybody for buying his book. But those things have come and gone. Nothing still happened. And no refund. And no refund. Yeah. <laughs> no. This is not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't get your money back, could you, Cliff? <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Now, we're told that uh, Zebulun and Naphtali fought bravely and that they brought 10,000 men. That's back in chapter 4, verse 10. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali together to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up with him. And Deborah also went up with him. Excuse me, ver, uh, verses 21 and 22. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon, O my soul, march on with strength. Then the horse's hooves beat from the, dash, uh, beat from the dashing, the dashing for, of his valiant steeds. The iron chariots of the Canaanites were ineffective by the river bottoms. Totally ineffective. And also in that day, horses were not shod. The retreat from Kishon on the roads was so rapid, it apparently split the hooves of the horses. So the riders couldn't ride on them. So uh, they, had to, they had to hoof it themselves. Verse 23, curse Meroz, said the angel of Yahweh. Utterly curse its inhabitants, because they did not come to the help of Yahweh, to the help of Yahweh against the warriors. Now, don't know much about Moroz. You ever heard of Moroz? Um, it was apparently a prominent city in Naphtali before this time. But the people of the city did not come out to help. And strangely enough, that's the last we hear of Moroz. We hear nothing more about them in Scripture. Apparently the curse worked. <clears throat> and that's where it is. It's up there in the north. Verse 24, most blessed of women is Yael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Most blessed is she of women in the tent. He asked for water, she gave him milk. In a significant bowl, she brought him curds. She reached out her hand for the tent peg and her right hand for the workman's hammer. Then she struck Sisera. She smashed his head and she shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet, he bowed. He fell, he lay. Between her feet, he bowed. He fell where he bowed. There he fell dead. Uh, Yael, she's remembered for her bravery in killing Sisera, the commander of the Canaanites. It appears she struck him in the head and drove that tent peg through his temple and into the ground. So he didn't need a double tap. Just a single tap got him. Verse 28. Out of the window she looked and lamented. The mother of Sisera threw the lattice. Why does his chariot delay in coming? Why do the hoofbeats of his chariots tarry? Her wise princesses would answer her. Indeed, she repeats her words to herself. Are they not finding? Are they not dividing the spoil? A maiden, two maidens for every warrior. To Sisera, a spoil of dyed work, a spoil of dyed work embroidered. Dyed work of double embroidery on the neck of the spoiler. Uh, Sisera's mama, she's looking out the window and saying, when is my son going to be back? He should be back. I know they won. They always win. 
in battle. Uh, and her princesses helped her. She, they said, well, they're dividing the spoil. She says, oh, of course. Every fighter under Cicero is going to get one or two maidens. So they've got to divide all those up. That takes time. That's why he's not back yet. Uh, and he's probably going to get a, a, some dyed work for his m mama. Okay, some really nice, pretty clothing. That's what he's working on. That's why he's late. That's not why he's late. Verse 31. Thus let all your enemies perish, O Yahweh. But let those who love him be like the rising sun in its might. And the land was undisturbed for 40 years. The fate of Sisera, that's going to be the fate of all the enemies of Israel. <clears throat> Am I missing verse 1 of... Yeah. This chapter. Was it a, a song? Yes, it was a song. It had eight stanzas. Different facets of them taking the land and, and the victories that they got. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, kind of. They never really took it all back, back. But they had victories. They had a lot of victories. Once again, it's that wheel turning, you know. Yeah. Right. That's it, always. And it just happened over and over again. And I want to go back over the Psalm 83. This is key in understanding a lot of prophecy in Scripture. Very important. Psalm 83, um, and I've heard people say, call this the Psalm 83 war. Well, it doesn't really describe a war. Okay? It describes a people wanting to go to war. Verse 1 says, O Elohim, do not remain quiet, do not be silent, and O Elohim, do not be still. For behold, your enemies make an uproar, and those who hate you have exalted themselves. They make shrewd plans against your people and conspire together against your treasured ones. And they've said, Come, let us wipe them out as a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. For they've conspired together with one mind. Against you do they make a covenant. See, it just sounds like... Uh, Islam today. And it goes on and it lists ten peoples. Okay, now these ten, they are the ten horns that are on the beast. That's it described in Daniel chapter 7. It's also in Revelation. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebel and Ammon and Amalek, Philistia and the inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria has also joined with them. They become a help to the children of Lot. Selah. See, those ten people, uh, by the way, the children of Lot are two of them already listed there. Um, Moab and Ammon. But they have become, it says, uh, they become a help to the children of Lot. And then Selah, think about this. You see, all these people were absorbed by the Arab nation. And that's where they ended up. As we continue, yeah. Yeah, he was a leader of the enemy. Okay. Says, he didn't know who she was? No. He didn't know who she was? Well, I think he did know who she was and thought he could trust her. Uh, it was, was it he, so wasn't that Heber's wife? And I think that he and Heber had a yes and no type relationship. And I guess it ended up being a no. Yeah, she's, she, she really made the, the call on that <laughs> as to whether it was a good or bad relationship. Yeah, to pretend to help him. Uh, how many miles did he run? What would we say, like 50 miles? Warm milk and curds. Yep. Probably never felt a thing, which maybe was too good for him, but... Now, uh, the psalm continues, deal with them as with Midian, as when Sisera and Jabin at the torrent of Kishon, who were destroyed at Endor, who became as dung for the ground. Okay, um, so I, I'm, I marked these places on the map for you. Here's Endor. Okay, this is Megiddo. 
This is the Valley of Megiddo, the whole thing is. This is the torrent of Kishon. Of That's the Kishon River. It goes through the Valley of Megiddo, which is Armageddon. He says, deal with these people, these ten, the same way you dealt with Sisera and Jabin at the torrent of Kishon. Deal with them there the same way. And that's what's going to happen. Verse 11, make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb. Now you're going to learn about Oreb and Zeb here next week. Who said, let us possess for ourselves the pastures of Elohim. O my Elohim, make them like a whirling, the whirling dust, like chafe before the wind. Okay, make them like whirling dust, like chafe before the wind. Do you remember a vision that Nebuchadnezzar had in Daniel chapter 2? Now, I'm not going to take you there, but I'll describe it. <clears throat> um, he has this vision of a, of a statue, of this big statue. And it was probably a statue of him, actually. Uh, and it had a head of gold. And it had arms and a uh, chest of silver. It had a midsection of brass. It had legs of iron. And then it had feet of iron mixed with clay. Okay? Now, this, this stone that was cut without hands comes down and hits the statue at its feet. And what happened to that? Let me just read just a little bit of that to you. If my arms are long enough to hold this away from my eyes. <clears throat> okay. Um, it says, and then there will be a, uh, a fourth kingdom, as strong as iron, and as much as iron crushes and shatters all things. So iron break, uh, uh, like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all those in pieces. That's talking about the legs. That's Rome. The head of gold was Babylon. The chest of silver uh, was the Media Persian Empire. The midsection of brass was the Greek Empire. The legs are the Eastern and Western Roman Empire. <clears throat> and let's see. Uh, in the end that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. It will be a divided kingdom. This is Islam. It's a divided kingdom. Have you ever seen a kingdom more divided than Islam? No, I haven't either. Yeah? The gold, did that represent the strength of the area? Because the value or the, the, the value decreases as it goes down. Yes. Okay, the, the, okay, the, the autonomy, the autocracy of, of Nebuchadnezzar had never been matched before. Okay? And the, the empire was really less of a pure empire as it goes down. Right. Okay? Uh, that's why the, 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 each empire represented by an element of some sort is less valuable or less precious as it right. descends the stack. Right. Um, it will have in it the toughness of iron. Okay, it'll be a divided kingdom. Now, it'll have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of feet are partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will, will be strong, some of it will be brittle. You can see that too, can't you? It's very clear. In that you saw the iron mixed with common clay. Okay, the word mixed. If you want to look it up, it's a Hebrew word. It's the iron mixed with clay. The word is Arab. Arab. They will combine, there's that word again, Arab. They will combine with one another in the seed of men. They will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. Is that a better description? Could you describe Islam better? They don't adhere to one another, but they're very strong, but they're very brittle in a lot of ways. <clears throat> uh, and what he saw in that king's dream then the iron, the clay, the bronze, okay, whoops. You continued looking until a stone cut, cut out without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Where did it strike? At the feet, okay? It struck at the feet. <clears throat> then it 
Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were, were crushed all at the same time and became like chafe from the summer threshing floors. Like chafe from the summer threshing floors. Look at verse 13. O oh, my Elohim, make them like the whirling dust, like chafe before the wind. Okay? These things all tie together. They're all telling the, uh, the similar story. <clears throat> it's, uh, Islam is it. Okay? And Islam descends from the, it, it's an Arab religion. Uh, not all of Islam are, uh, are Arab, like Iran, for instance. But hold it, we've got Babylon. That was ahead, remember? What are they now? Iraq. Uh, hold it, we've got Media Persia Empire. Who are they today? Iran. Okay? Most of the, much of the Greek Empire nowadays is just swallowed up by, the, by Islam, as is a lot of the Roman Empire now. Spain, France, Sweden. Uh, <laughs> you see, that's why it's all going to be smashed. They're all going to be smashed when it hits the feet of iron mixed with clay, when that stone does. That's Messiah coming and returning and destroying Islam. <clears throat> um, Verse 14, like fire that burns a forest and like a flame that sets the mountains on fire. So pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. Fill their faces with this honor that they may seek your name, O Yahweh. Let them be ashamed and dismayed forever. Let them be humiliated and perish that they may know that you alone, whose name is Yahweh, are the most high over all the earth. <clears throat> okay, let's continue. We'll be coming back to that psalm again here too. Verse 1 of Judges 6, Then the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and Yahweh gave them into the hands of Midian seven years. See, we thought we got rid of Midian, but we didn't quite get rid of them yet. Um, in the previous chapter, we saw the land of Israel and the people were undisturbed for 40 years, and sometimes we just can't stand prosperity, you know? Um, the people of Israel did evil in the sight of Elohim, so Elohim give, uh, gives them into the hands of the Midianite, of the Midianites, and the Midianites are a son of Abraham. Uh, Genesis 25, verses 1 and 2, Now Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah, and she bore to him Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. Uh, it was Ishmaelites from Midian who bought Joseph as a slave from his brothers. That's in Genesis 37, verse 28. Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. Moses' father was a Midianite. In Exodus 2, verses 15 and 16. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Now, it was also Midianite women who lured many Israelite men into idol worship. That's in Numbers 25, verses 16 through 18. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Be hostile to the Midianites and strike them, for they've been hostile to you with their tricks, with which they've deceived you in the affair of Peor and in the affair of Cosby the daughter of the leader of Midian, their sister who was slain on the day of the plague because of Peor. Go back to Judges 6, verse 2. And the power of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves the dens which were in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. So Israel was driven out of their land, and they had to go hide in the dens and in the caves and the mountains. Verse 3, for it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites would come up with the Amalekites and the sons of the east and go against them. It's the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the sons of east that would invade Israel. The sons of the east, that's likely a lot of those causing Israel problems today. The Midianites would wait until Israel had sown the ground, okay, do the hard work, then they'd drive them out. It was previously prophesied that would happen due to their disobedience. That's in the Torah. Leviticus 26, verse 16, I in turn will do this to you. 
I will appoint over you a sudden terror, consumption, and fever that shall waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. Also, you will sow your seed need uselessly, for your enemy shall eat it up. He told him it would happen. It's in Deuteronomy 28 also. Verses 30 through 33, you shall betroth a wife, but another man shall violate her. You shall build a house, but you shall not live in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but you shall not use its fruit. Your ox shall be slaughtered before your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Your donkey shall be torn away from you and shall not be restored to you. Your sheep shall be given to your enemies and you shall have none to save you. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people. While your eyes look on and yearn for them continually, but there shall be nothing you can do. The people whom you do not know shall eat up the produce of your ground and all your labors. And you shall never be anything but oppressed and crushed continually. That's part of the curses thing. Israel. Due to disobedience, he said, this is what's going to happen to you. Going back to Judges 6, verses 4 through 6. So they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come in like locusts for number. Both they and their camels were innumerable, and they came to the land to devastate it. So Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the sons of Israel cried to Yahweh. So Midian would take away all the produce of the land, as well as the sheep, ox, and donkeys. What they didn't take, they destroyed. They didn't change much, have they? <laughs> notice that uh, Midian is described as locusts here. Did you notice that? They would come in like locusts for number. Very important to remember that type of thing. You know, uh, does that mean the Midianites were locusts? No. What does that mean? They're swarmed like that. Okay, so when you hear prophecy speak of locusts, what's it likely speaking of? A swarming army. That's what it's speaking of. Revelation 9 just happens to have that. Verses 3 through 7. Out of the smoke came forth locusts upon the earth, and power was given to them as the scorpions of the earth have power. And they were told that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who did not have the seal of Elohim on their foreheads. They were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They'll long to die, and death flees from them. And the appearance of locusts was like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads, as it were, crowns of gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. Uh... If I had more time, I'd go over this with you. But keep in mind, locusts are swarming armies. That's what it is. And these are swarming armies. It happens to be the Roman Empire it's speaking of here. And it says uh, it's not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And only the men who do not have the seal of Elohim on their foreheads. So they have the mark of the beast instead. Not those that have the seal of Elohim, but those who have the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is to be a Muslim. And uh, he's going to torment, not, uh, not to kill anyone, but torment them for five months. What swarming army? When did, this is when I was trying to figure this out. What, when did the Roman army torment Islam for five months? Well, I know that the day is a year. I had to look that up. And come to find out we're dealing with 150 years or so. When did the Romans, when did the Roman people, the Roman army torment Islam for 150 years? Did you ever hear of the colonization of Africa and the Middle East? Middle East? That's what it's talking about. That's the colonization of Africa and the Middle East. And it says the, tor the torment of Islam was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They'll long to die. And they didn't kill any. They didn't kill the, uh, Islam. They just drove them out. And they left. In Islam, they said it hurt worse than death to be driven out by the Kafirs, by the infidels. But they did. They drove them out. And they actually left without a fight. <clears throat> and I, I didn't know that much about the colonization of, uh, of Africa and the Middle East until I studied it here. 
when I was looking at this and, and I happened to uh, just Google things like Roman Empire against Islam, 150 years, and that's how long it was. Almost to the day, 150 some odd years, and I calculated it out. But it was uh, fascinating. You know, uh, they're saying that uh, they look at that Islam and, and the Middle East looks at the United States as a colonializing power. We're part of the West. We didn't colonialize any of Africa or the Middle East, but they consider us a part of that anyway. Um, they consider us, you know, the Islam considers us the colonializers, the bad guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, famous people that were born in Kenya, that's why they had a grudge against this country. It was because of the colonialization uh, that happened in years previously. Going back to Judges 6, starting in verse 7, it came about when the sons of Israel cried to Yahweh on account of Midian that Yahweh sent a prophet to the sons of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, It was I who brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of your oppressors, and dispossessed them before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not obeyed me. We're not told the name of this prophet sent to Israel. And, and I'm... I'm I do believe that there were quite a few more prophets that Elohim sent. The scripture doesn't even mention. Um, and this is, this is one of them. At least didn't mention his name. He reminds them that they're in this situation because of their disobedience to the Torah. Keep in mind, the role of the prophet is to turn the people back to the ways of Elohim. Verse 11, And the angel of Yahweh came and sat under the oak which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Yoash the Abuzite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in a wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. <clears throat> uh, okay, let me t give you tell you a secret about Gideon. He was not a brave man. You know what he's doing? He's threshing wheat in the lowland of Ophrah. Now, how do you thresh wheat? You throw it up in the air. The chafe blows away, and the grain comes down. Well, he's in the lowland of Ophrah because he's scared of the Midianites. There's no wind, okay? So everything's just coming back down on top of him. Yeah. The chafe just comes down, kind of clears his eyes out. <clears throat> uh, well, and like I said, he's, he's not a very brave guy. Uh, he's hiding from the Midianites. You know, they're not going to suspect him threshing the the grain in the lowlands. Uh, he doesn't seem to be the epitome of courage at all. Gideon doesn't. Verse 12, And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him and said to him, Yahweh is with you, O valiant warrior. Okay, angel of Yahweh. That's a manifestation of the Father. In later verses, he's referred to simply as Yahweh. He's sitting under an oak tree watching Gideon at this time. Now, that's a sarcastic comment, all right? Oh, valiant warrior. Uh, actually, Elohim doesn't want the biggest and the strongest and the bravest all the time. He wants to show his power and his might. Verse 13, then Gideon said to him, Oh, my master, my Adonai, if Yahweh is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not Yahweh bring us up from Egypt? But now Yahweh has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And Yahweh looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? Gideon wants to know why Elohim abandoned his people. Now Gideon wants deliverance for the, peop for the people, but he wants Elohim to perform great things and deliver them miraculously without him getting involved. Verses 15 and 16, he said to him, O Adonai, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I'm the youngest in my father's house. But Yahweh said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall de defeat Midian as one man. Does Gideon sound like Moses here, trying to get excuses to not do it? 
Trying to weasel out of it a little bit, yeah. He does not consider himself to be the kind of man that Elohim can use to do this type of task. Yeah, more like a clerk back there at the grain store. Yes, that's, that's more like, well, he says his family, hey, my family, they're the least in Manasseh. And really, did you notice? I'm the runt. I'm the littlest in my family. Uh, Elohim says Gideon will defeat the Midianites as if there were just one man. <clears throat> um, why is that there? Verse 17. So Gideon said to him, if now I found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speaks with me. Please do not depart from here until I come back to you and bring out my offering and lay it before you. And he said, I'll remain until you return. Then Gideon went in and prepared a, a kid and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. He put the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot and brought them out to him under the oak and presented them. Uh, this is similar to what Abraham did. With when the angel of Yahweh visited. That's why I had this here. Genesis 18, the first verse is, And Yahweh appeared to him at the Oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. Then skipping down to verse 6, So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it, and make bread cakes. Abraham also ran to the herd and took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant. And he hurried to prepare it. He took curds and milk and the calf which he'd prepared and placed it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. Very similar scene here. Yeah. Oh, you didn't think they did the dairy and meat together. Right, right. I guess they did before. That's a good point. Yeah, I guess the cheeseburger's okay. <clears throat> Verses 20 and 21. The angel of Elohim said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of Yahweh put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of Yahweh vanished from his sight. So that meat and bread were consumed by the fire. Gideon's Offering is treated like a sacrifice to Elohim. <coughs> and by him, too, at that. Verse 22, when Gideon saw that he was the angel of Yahweh, he said, Alas, O Adonai Yahweh, for now I've seen the angel of Yahweh face to face. And Yahweh said to him, Peace to you, do not fear, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to Yahweh and named it Yahweh is Peace. To this day, it is still in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. Um, Gideon was afraid that he, he was going to die now that he saw Elohim, because you can't see him and live. In Exodus 33, verse 20, but he said, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Yeah, Pom? Um, I thought there was only one place that you make sacrifices. That's the place he designates. I know, but he designated that place at that time. Okay, but is it still there, you said? And he did it. Elohim did it. Well, can, can the Israelites go there and make sacrifices? No. The place moved. Okay. That's why we're yeah. And it was only designated for him at that time, for Gideon at that time. <clears throat> um, why didn't he die? He saw, he saw Yahweh face to face. Why didn't he die? It was a manifestation of the Father. He, he manifested himself in human form. Okay. And he does that several times. He did it with Abraham. He did it with Gideon. He did it with Jacob. Remember? He said the same thing. I saw Yahweh face to face. Did he, wrestle with Jacob? he wrestled with Jacob. Messed his hip up. Yep. And uh, you see this, and, and that's a, that is a, you know, an argument against uh, Yeshua's Messiah is that the Father, I don't know if they think he can't manifest himself in the flesh. Or if he just wouldn't, even though he did it several times in the Tanakh. I, I don't know how that argument works for them. But anyway, <clears throat> he did it because that way Gideon could look upon him and not die. Verse 25, now the same night it came about that Yahweh said to him, Take your father's bull and a second bull seven years old and 
Pull down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. And build an altar to Yahweh your Elohim on the top of this stronghold in an orderly manner. Take a second bull and offer a burnt offering with the wood of Asherah, which you shall cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as Yahweh had spoken to him. And it came about because he was too afraid of his father's household and the men of the city to do it by day that he did it by night. So once again, <laughs> Gideon is not a real brave guy. It's interesting, Gideon questions why Elohim has abandoned Israel, and he knows his own father is worshiping false gods. Okay? He knows he is. And even at the command of Elohim, Gideon is afraid of his father and afraid of his father's men. Verse 28, when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was torn down, and the Asherah which was beside it, the Christmas tree beside it, was cut down. And the second bull was offered on the altar which had been built. And they said to one another, who did this thing? When they searched about and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, did this thing. Then the men of the city said to Joash, bring out your son, let he, that he may die, for he's torn down the altar of Baal, and indeed <clears throat> he has cut down the Asherah which was beside it. So the men there of, uh, of the city, they want to put Gideon to death for destroying their precious altar and taking down their altar to Baal and their precious Christmas trees. Verse 31. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal or will you deliver him? Whoever will plead for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is, if he is a god, let him contend for himself because someone has torn down his altar. Well... Yoash, that's, uh, that's Gideon's father. Now, Yoash states that whoever pleads for Baal will be put to death. He says, now, if Baal is truly a god, he can, he can fend for himself, and he can defend himself. He can get his own revenge, because apparently he didn't defend himself very well last night. Verse 32. Therefore, on that day, he named him you're a Baal. That is to say, let Baal contend against him because he had torn down his altar. They gave that, uh, Gideon that nickname that day. They named him, let Baal plead against him or let the shameful thing plead. Verse 33, then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the sons of the east assembled themselves and they crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. <clears throat> the sons of the east, there we are. I think that's uh, a lot of those listed in Psalm 83. Now, um, as we mentioned before, I hadn't combined these two chapters uh, previously, but uh, Edom, Ishmaelites, Moab, the Hagrites, Gebel, Ammon, Amalekah, Philistia, Tyre, and Assyria, uh, they make up the modern Arab people. And they're to be gathered at, <clears throat> at Megiddo, uh, Megiddo, which is Armageddon. Yeah, that's your ten horns. Deal with them as with Midian, with Sisera, and Jabin at the torrent of Kishon. Sisera and Jabin were destroyed by, uh, by the Kishon River, and Midian was destroyed at the Valley of Jezreel. And the Valley of Jezreel, that's another name for uh, Armageddon, Megiddo. <clears throat> Verse 33 then all the Midianites, the Amalekites, the sons of the east assembled themselves and they crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel, which is Megiddo. In Revelation 16, verse 16, and they gathered together in a place which in Hebrew, Hebrew is called Armageddon. <clears throat> okay. And just to make it clear here, this is the valley of Jezreel and Megiddo. Uh, these are all in the same place. And, that's the, and this is the Kishon River going down through that valley. Verse 34, So the Spirit of Yahweh came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and the Abiezerites were called together to follow him. Now the Hebrew text literally means the Spirit of the Father put on Gideon. It's as if the Spirit of Elohim used Gideon as clothing here. The uh, Abiezerites are the Manassites and the Benjamites. I wish I'd just say Manassites and Benjamites because I can say that easier. Verse 35. 
And he sent messengers throughout Manasseh, and they also were called together to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. All the tribes that Gideon called upon here, uh, they sent men to fight. But Gideon has issues. Uh, still not a, not a brave guy. Not sure of himself. Not sure of anything. <coughs> he just saw the father himself burn up off, offerings to himself. He just saw a, uh, a miracle of him destroying all the f- fake gods that they had and him being, getting off clean. Uh, but it wasn't enough. Verse 36, Then Gideon said to Elohim, If you will deliver Israel through me as you've spoken, behold, I'll put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew on the fleece only, and it's dry on all the ground, then I'll know that you will deliver Israel through me as you've spoken. And it was so, when he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he drained the dew from the fleece, a bowl full of water. Now, Gideon wasn't really using this to test the presence of Elohim. Yeah. Nor is he using this to determine the will of Elohim. He simply is scared. His faithfulness needs bolstering. Gideon asked that Elohim give him a sign. And that sign being that there be fleece on the ground, the ground be dry, but the fleece be, be wet the next morning. And Elohim did as he requested. Verse 39, then Gideon said to Elohim, don't let your anger burn against me that I may speak once more. Please let me make a test once more with the fleece. Only let it be dry only on the fleece and let there be dew on all the ground. So Elohim did so that night, for it was dry only on the fleece and the dew was on all the ground. So he asked for a reverse of that request. He asked the fleece be dry and the ground be wet. And Elohim did as Gideon asked. What's that? Yeah? It is. Interesting. Yeah, David. So this isn't putting him to the test. No. Because it's not questioning his No, it's not questioning his praise talking to him. Yeah. Okay. He's talking to him. But he's scared. I'm telling you, this is not a brave guy. And how many of y'all had pictured Gideon as a very brave warrior in the past? You had, hadn't you? No, he wasn't. Yep, Joshua and Caleb. Yeah, yeah, we'll get into that. Yeah, next week. Uh huh. Right. No, he's not. You know, he he starts out real real, real coward. Okay. And we miss so much. Oh, so much. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because we're in so much of this. Yeah. So that, that's what I'm trying to show. Some of this is contemporary. Because this, this does speak of Islam in, in, in action and in word and in, in what's saying here. And th- this, is, uh, this is where they came from. And they've always been this way. These people have always been this way. They always hated Israel. They always wanted them destroyed. See, this battle at the end is going to be the battle at the very beginning. Jacob versus Esau. Isaac versus Ishmael. Yeah. Okay, so the ten that are listed in Saul. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, just as I'm going to go. Who was it? There's two. Cicero and Jabin. Okay, they don't exist anymore. No. Yeah. Neither does Midian. Okay, so there's eight. So who replaced those two? Because there's still ten. Oh, no, Cicero and Jabin were, separate, were ones that were, okay, good question. Don't you remember there were three horns that were pulled up before it? That's Sisera, Jabin, and Midian. Okay, yeah. What? No, no, that's the the bear. Yeah, that that was the bear, and that was uh, Persia who defeated Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. Okay, that's ribs. Yeah. Baal and Asherim, yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah. Uh, well, uh, it makes you wonder, I mean, all the things that Elohim did for his people, and, 
And this, the, obviously these other gods haven't done anything. Right. They're not gods. Right. And <laughs> Gideon's dad just realized that. Gideon's dad just realized that. Well, if, if Baal is a god, why didn't he defend himself? Yeah. I mean, uh, that's a good question. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Some made him believe to start with, you think? Oh, yeah, it was stupidity. Yeah, David. See, ashram, that's kind of up in the air. Ashram, it was, it could be, it could be trees, it could be poles that were used for worship, um, and it was a, a grove, usually. Uh, not a single tr tr tree or whatever, and I facetiously refer to them as Christmas trees. So, but we, don't really we don't know for sure, no. Grove of trees or poles, but we don't know for sure. Could be. Totem pole could be considered one. Yeah. Likely it was something like that. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, let's uh, pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your word once again. And, and as we go through it, we do pray for a greater understanding. And uh, Father, we most of all, we want to fear you and be obedient to you. And that comes only through your breath, your spirit within us. And for that, we praise your name as we pray as your humble servants. Amen.